Good evening and welcome back uh, to this double bill with Professor Joe Gouldy, hosted by the Turing's Living with Machines project. My name is Ruth Arnott. I'm the PI of Living with Machines and also Professor of Literary History and Digital Humanities at Queen Mary University of London. So we are delighted to have Jo with us here today. We have been hosting her all week on the Living with Machines project where we've been cooking up some new project ideas. So our project takes a computational approach to the nation's archives using machine learning to explore the impact of industrialization on the lives of everyday people in the long 19th century. The project therefore has important overlaps with Joe's own work, working as she does on the history of infrastructure and technology and as a scholar of history who uses big data methods to approach traditional questions of humanities scholars. Joe's first book, Roads to Power, explored the transformation of road networks in Britain in the 18th and 19th centuries uh, in making the, making the nation an infrastructure state. In 2014, her second book, The History Manifesto, co-authored with David Armitage, discussed the potential effect that digital analysis would have on questions of periodization, graduate student training, and the audience in the discipline of history. Her current work focuses on using machine learning and statistical approaches, such as topic modeling, to understand the history of Great Britain, especially as it intersects with the history of concepts about property, rent, and eviction. She'll be speaking today on her brand new book, The Long Land War, which was published in the UK in April. It's been hailed as a tour de force telling the story of land occupation and eviction both across time and geographical borders. And I can't wait to hear her speak today. So please join me in welcoming Jo. Thank you so much for that introduction, Ruth. It's wonderful to be back here with you. The title that I have today is Can Humanity Change Its, its Trajectory? Climate Survival as a Problem of 20th Century Thinking. In a society where people merely feared technology, the government would simply regulate it, judging coal plants and industrial farms to far more dangerous than alcohol or tobacco. But technology is intertwined with our commutes and our supply chains, which, which makes extrapolating a carbon-limited future difficult. Our nations dare not limit it, though scientists tabulate its cost and protesters fill the streets. Endless debate about the governance or ungovernability of technology are symptomatic of our era as a whole. The debates about carbon emission targets and the failure of nations to meet them, the succession of international meetings over decades, and the consequent era of political paralysis around climate change. It is as if faced with the problem of survival itself, Humanity were capable of doing nothing to change its trajectory. But technology is not even the best word for the sites where innovation occurs today. The paperclip may outlast thousands of apps, but it's the connection of transactions embedded in the pipes of the internet that launch a thousand ride shares and delivery services. The word for shared systems and connections is not technology, it is infrastructure. Like road or rail, infrastructure con connects and makes new relationships possible. Even in the era of, era of the internet, infrastructure implies governance. Someone, whether state or corporation, is always designing and governing what is measured, what information is collected, and whose interests are supported by those developments. There are few things more dangerous than ignoring infrastructure. Consider the pattern of headlines typical of modern newspapers when they review the environment. Half of the headlines are demonic accounts of how technology has gotten away from us, evidencing a certain degree of climate doom. David Wallace Wells warns about the astronomical cost of private aircraft each of whose beneficiaries generate in, an annual, in one year an annual carbon impact exceeding that of many small nations. Bitcoin servers likewise consume energy day and night and automate the search for, in their automated search for abstract value. Oil wells in Texas are discovered to spew methane and the owners can't be ha found to be held accountable. It is not, of course, merely that tech journalists portray these scenarios with alarm. They are factually alarming. 
more important is that added together, especially with the perspective of history, they tell us that we are living in an era in which tech and money have exerted a downright demonic force over the organs of democracy that are otherwise entrusted with the public good. And this appearance of an age of demonic technology raises questions about how much we control our own fate. There is plenty of evidence to suggest that we are in crisis in part because of past events that are outside our control. And here history seems to punctuate how little individuals can do to repair the situation. Looking backwards, historians Naomi Orestes and Eric Conway have made the case that the techno -jugger juggernaut of the oil interest is to blame for tilting American politics against regulation. Historian Dipesh Chakrabarti has analyzed the problem as one of path dependency, the consequences of choices made long ago to pursue the steam engine, imperial exploitation, and cities of increasing size, all of which together expand the demand on carbon through transport and agricultural production in a way that cannot be easily reversed by simple decisions like changing a light bulb. Historical accounts validate the coming of carbon economies and the persuasive power of carbon interests in politics as a demon that cannot be recalled, even as it ferries exucts across the very rivers of Hades. But technology also appears in many of these stories as our last hope for exerting rational control. It is, after all, infrared maps from satellites that allow us to discover the pace of rainforest exploitation or uncapped methane leaks. Paul Hawkins' book, Drawdown, spells out scientifically informed plans for carbon capture through existing such solutions, such as small farming or the preservation of peat bogs. More speculatively, economist Bjorn Lomberg theorizes that efficient markets automatically contrive the technologies most needed. Not only demon, technology also appears as a saving angel who might appear just in time, if we are lucky. Faith in this angel's prompt appearance apparently undergirds the confidence of most mainstream politicians that delayed climate action is an appropriate gamble. But to be clear, this is a gamble on economic theory, and it lacks the confidence of anything like a law of history. Here is the 21st century situation in a nutshell. Our technological world burns carbon and imperils the atmosphere. Meanwhile, the engineers and scientists scheme for survival. Journalists alternate their attitudes towards technology between raw astonishment before the immensity of the task controlling carbon and secure faith in the promise of science. If climate news makes you feel crazy, this binary of helplessness is probably why. It is also not the only possible way of seeing things. Fully extrapolated, our era teaches that tech is both God and demon the source of electric cars powered by the sun and the systems that demand the ravaging of Earth for dangerous raw metals and batteries, such that a tech-run planet is also a planet that we must use tech to escape, and hence the worldview of Elon Musk. But there is something problematic about this view because it leaps forward from the fixation and fear without the analysis of who suffers and who benefits in each regime. Let us remember that machines are almost always embedded in a larger system. By the end of the, en the 19th century, the French economists developed a word for these networks, infrastructure, a word for the systems that can connect technology and form a new technology in and of themselves. Originally, infrastructure referred to just the material connections, the roads, rails, or pipes that perforate buildings and straddle administrative boundaries. Most infrastructure systems, however, were already more than pipes. They were bureaucracies, in fact, made of people, information, and data, and governed by standards to benefit the corporation or the public, depending on who was in charge. Many 19th century infrastructures, like national road networks or public bridges, were always already also structures of information. They were run by public bodies of civil engineers who were charged with developing standards for meeting the common good. They published their data, and sometimes bad decisions led to other reforms. The word infrastructure indicates a system below. Indeed, early infrastructures were demonic spaces, as Rosalind Williams has suggested. Coal came from spaces below the earth where children labored. Subterranean trains, pipes, and wires connected modern cities. And contemporary illustrations highlighted the weirdness of these newly clandestine caverns where men and women, water and messages were shuttled across property lines and between neighborhoods. 
Infrastructure also determines what happens above, in the atmosphere. Road, rail, and highway create cities that depended upon the burning of fossil fu fuels for the continued provisioning with food, building materials, and other supplies. The majority of carbon-producing and carbon-containing infrastructure is in fact hidden, not below or above, but away. It takes place in the developing world, where rainforests are cut down, peak peat bogs drained, mining co where corpor mining corporations threaten the lives of small farmers whose practices keep carbon in the ground. 30% of our emissions are from industrial farms in the developed world, which don't produce human food by and large, but only animal f feed and fuel, often with enormous public subsidies behind them. The land that actually produces 85% of the world's food for humans is usually unsubsidized and grown by small farmers whose practices do more than almost any other sector to keep carbon in the ground. In a world rationalized around keeping carbon out of the atmosphere, data would guide global land use policies to protect the small farmers, rainforests, and peat bogs, to punish those who damage them. We would pair the rights of local people to monitor their own land, to be free from eviction and pollution, with our common need to protect Earth's atmosphere. But such a world would require an international information infrastructure to collect data on local practices. It would require an international policy re regime. The problem, in other words, is not so much the technology as the entire system of data, understanding, policymaking, and cooperation around the technologies that already exist. Stopping strip mining from destroying small farms, cultivating peat bogs, and valuing rainforests are processes that require a new vision of data. If that data is to be used not only to manage land, but also to protect traditional communities that inhabit those zones, the data must be col col collected by the inhabitants themselves. And such a system is within the realm of feasibility if the will to build and fund it exists in the developed world. Local communities are already experimenting with using handheld devices to track flood, desertification, pollution, and disease. But citizens need to be paid to collect data about where the rainforest is bur burned because the communities on the front lines of climate change are also already economically and politically vulnerable. Their data needs to be housed within a robust system of data management and governance for the planetary tracking of emissions, pollution, and eviction. And the data must be preserved in an archive where it can be found, retrieved, revisited, and implemented for action, including the analysis of the data by both community participants and laboratory scientists. Action requires new government mechanisms, something that requires the establishment of a centralized, powerful organ of governance capable of holding polluters to account on the basis of data collected by both citizens and scientists. Such a system would require transparent mechanisms for review and negotiation. It could be designed, but the design of such a system for keeping carbon in the ground would be one of the most important technical innovations for our continued survival. Now, failure to design robust shared systems can undermine the most important initiatives to limit carbon. Indeed, that is happening already. Today, no nation is bound by its voluntary pledge to the IPCC agreements to limit carbon. Rather, there is little penalty for failing to act. COP27 failed to recruit the agreements to limit carbon necessary to limit warning to 1.5 degrees C, and even those agreements were jettisoned as par politicians embraced other priorities. Indeed, these failures come as no surprise to those who know the history of international governance in the Cold War. The UN was designed from the beginning not to succeed, as m historian Mac M Mark Mazur has explained. International agencies at their founding were choked by a post-war balance of power. The system of international politics was designed so that the UN could never tell the US or European powers what to do and so threaten the balance of power from the colonial era. At the UN, these limits meant that the UN could never require U European or US support for developing world policies or even atmospheric ones. An international stalemate over climate change is the direct result of falling into Cold War patterns of governance, making effectively impossible any international climate agreement that requires conformity from the developed world. 
In the absence of strong international institutions, climate policy is left in the hands of individual nations where it is vulnerable to co-optation or simply being crushed. In my country, the United States, the Supreme Court has overturned the Environmental Protection Agency's ability to regulate carbon. The Green New Deal was abandoned after a stalemate forced by two senators, one from a coal-rich state. Most analysts believe that Democrats will lose the Senate and the presidency, leaving America governed by ch climate change deniers during the very decade in which American climate leadership is most important. In the UK, Parliament has effectively banned citizen action to protect the climate by making protest and direct, direct action a crime. The dynamics of national politics were also shaped by Cold War conversations, when national politics were delimited by a slavish faith that the nation must not tamper with the market. In the US, neoliberal philosophers like Milton Friedman argued against rent control and for the market as the sole rational force for allocating property rights. In the UK, a think tank called the Institute for Economic Affairs began to compile pamphlets imagining a free market world where even public libraries charged for their services. The IEA's most powerful push was for the privatization of the housing market. They succeeded. Margaret Thatcher was their candidate, and many of the plans for monetizing the housing market, undoing public housing, and selling London houses to the highest bidder as a form of financial collateral, that is, not a, not a home, originated in the offices of the IEA. In the environment established by neoliberalism, grassroots movements working at the national level could accomplish little by way of structural reforms. In the 1960s, squatters in the UK wanted housing for all, but their marches and banners failed to achieve anything beyond temporary autonomous utopianism for the few and radical. In today's system, protesters are supposed to agree in advance not to disrupt economic flows. To a large degree, then, the failures of climate policy in our era echo the structural limitations on governance typical of the middle of the 20th century. Those limitations, a bar against inter binding international agreements, the delimitation of national governments by free market idealism, and the self-imposed limits to grassroots organizing, continue to structure climate politics today in the form of a political stalemate. If we want to understand the shape of movements for reform in the 20th century that did successfully accomplish a reconfiguration of how we govern the environment, one strong option is to consider the history of land reform, or the movements to correct the inequality of the developing world that resulted from co European colonization through redistributing land to small farmers and to ordinary householders in the city. The land reform movements were international in co and connected. In Britain, India, Mexico, the United States, across Asia, Africa, and Latin America, movements for occupancy rights struggled to redefine land, not as a private commodity to be bought and sold, but as a special kind of property, a property whose value was defined through inhabitation. Many of these movements won. They passed legislation in New York City, London, Bengal, Kerala, and Mexico that defined land as a collective resource for food and housing. And even in major Western cities, rent control measures endorsed the rights of working class citizens to live and thrive, free from fear of eviction and displacement. Were these environmental movements? Of course not. Environmentalism in its modern form did not exist in the 1880s when the story of land reform starts. Conservation, the contemporary movement, was a political orientation of elites interested in the pre preservation of scenery in places like the Lake District or Yosemite. And this movement was little concerned with the rights of local or indigenous people to democracy and freedom of displacement. But land reform and modern environmentalism share some important features. One is that both aimed for reforms that were fully planetary in nature. The movement for occupancy rights highlighted solidarities between international people's movements in this co the country and the city, across racial lines, and in the developed and underdeveloped world. Another commonality is that land reform movements of long ago grew out of the political movements of the most marginalized people on earth, colonized peasants and ind indigenous people. The communities that were evicted were most under colonialism, were most frequently those uh, marginalized communities, whether Scottish crofters or Irish tenants or landless Indian subletters or Kenyan Mau Mau or Adavasi. 
In Ireland, the National Land League staged march mass marches, counted evictions, and invented the boycott. In India, Gandhi and his followers led rent strikes and staged a 10-year pilgrimage in the name of voluntary land turnover from landlords to peasants. They protested a regime where the eviction of human subjects was required for the wealth of others. From Ireland in 1881, to India in 1917, to the United Nations in 1945, to the United States, the concerns of poor people's movements sh shared a conviction that the affordability of rent was at the basis of a livable society. In the 1960s, African Americans, indigenous and Latino movements in the US also made moves for redistributing land to repair the sins of the colonial past. Occupancy rights became a movement that unified the urban working class, ethnic minorities, indigenous people, and post-colonial people around the world. Today, many former colonized communities are on the front lines of climate change. Under climate change, the need for global government is again clear. All of us are served with a potential eviction notice, and our fates are intertwined. The mowing down of the rainforest in Brazil has consequences by way of evicting the indigenous communities who live there, as well as in terms of the eventual eviction or present eviction of families in London through the growing cost of living at a time of rising climate-related climate costs. One story, one lesson from the story of land reform then, is the importance of international grassroots movements when face facing a planetary crisis and the relative poverty of national movements. Today, a number of marches have flooded streets in London and New York City with protests calling for renewed climate politics. But few of these marches have, de have definitively accomplished a discernible shift of legislation that would change our carbon consuming way of life. Perhaps because the reforms they call for, for are primarily abstract and little linked to survive the survival or vo voices of frontline climate defenders in the developing world. Few strike at patterns of ownership in real property in the way that the land movements of the 19th century and early 20th century did. Whereas climate protesters have staged school strikes, land protesters staged rent strikes. That is, they actually withheld cash as individuals from the landlord class, even though it meant the eviction of individual families like the one shown here. This, these collective actions crippled the workings of capitalism to the left is a family about to be evicted by the Irish constabulary for non-payment of rent in a boycott of the landlord class. The nearest equivalent to these measures of today uh, is the disruption of traffic by Extinction Rebellion and campaigns for institutional divestment from carbon. But few of those actions have the symbolic power of millions of individuals withholding their money determined to crash an entire system. The symbolic power of protesting eviction is that individuals are putting their very homes, the place where their family sleeps, on the line, trusting their community to rehouse them. Climate change is evidently a crisis in our co collective possible eviction from the planet, and we need protests that dramatize the intimacy and immediacy of that reality. Another common feature of land reform and environmentalism is that both deal in the tricky area, area of rec regulation, which is the governance of private property and common rights. In land reform, formerly colonized people made the argument that people of colonized nations had a right to the land and that institutions needed to reverse the private enclosure of land under colonialism. It took half a century for these peasant actions to shift international politics, but in the end they did. They accomplished something like a revolution. A global redistribution of land occurred not merely in communist states like Russia, Cuba, and China, but also across Mexico, most of Latin America, and most parts of Asia and Africa. As well, if you count public housing and council housing in most of Europe and North America. From 1881 to 1974, legislation after legislation, court after court, and institution after institution effectively redefined land, not as a private commodity to be bought and sold like any other, but a special kind of property, a property whose value was defined by inhabitation. In environmentalism, as with land reform, we make arguments about how private enterprise is threatening us all through the continued emission of carbon into the atmosphere. 
The reform of property rights is crucial in both cases. The question becomes, is it possible to value inhabitation, health and atmosphere as a public good, even within a system of private capital? The story of land reform suggests that it was. Finally, both land reform and environmentalism ultimately suggest that we need global infrastructures and systems of governance capable of enforcing a common good. As my book explains, the global peasant movements around land reform contributed directly to the founding and mandate of certain offices at the United Nations, a step that effectively represented the creation of a global government of land, albeit one with no, no binding authority. So one of the other lessons of the global land reform movement is that international governance and international information infrastructures can support poor people's movements in their quest to secure inhabitation. As nation after nation passed legislation to redistribute land from the rich to the poor, UN technicians supported these nations in drafting new laws. The agencies convened leaders from the post-colonial world, employing Indian ec economists and and geographers. When the UN was founded, it coordinated an international movement to protect the rights of occupancy in the developed and underdeveloped world. And many arms of the United Nations housed ambitious information infrastructures to design, design to monitor world problems and provide the information and connections that would eventually supply solutions. And this was nowhere more true than at the Food and Agriculture Organization, the United Nations' first independent agency founded in Quebec City in 1945 and later headquartered in Rome. With its motto, Fiat Panis, let there be bread, the FAO is sometimes remembered as a wildly ambitious experiment with information systems designed to coordinate prices. But in the 1940s and 50s, it was often a radical or organization with an undisguised anti-colonial agenda. Many of the founding designers of programs at the FAO looked to post-colonial struggles as an omen of things to come. From the viewpoint of Doreen Warner, an early advisor to the FAO, land reform represented the peaceful path between communism and capitalism. In the formula of John Boyd Orr, the founding director general and winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, the former colonies of European empire around the globe were, would prosecute their claims to land because that was the shape of justice. Europeans might choose to resist, but only at the risk of delaying and exacerbating a crisis which was, in its basic form, inevitable. Both Doreen Warner and John Boyd Orr agreed that the redistribution of land around the world was necessary to avert an endless cycle of violence. The foul ultimately ran up against the system of limitations on international justice intended to keep US, the US and Europe in charge. After a conservative turn in US policy, a new World Bank took center stage under the directorship of Robert McNamara. In 1974, the FAO's budget was slashed and its support from, for small farmers was effectively forbidden. Hereafter, there would be no land floors, but only land ceilings. The FAO would become an administrator for land World Bank policies to privatize land around the world putting land on, on the market, a commodity like any other. Before this shift of power, however, the FAO had looked to information architecture as a cure for global problems. And the FAO's experience is instructive for how data, technology, and infrastructure might com contribute to the planetary fight against climate change today. FAO technicians published maps, seed catalogs, and bibliographies to support the proliferation of best practices around land tenure reform and land redistribution. Technology had a role to play at the FAO, neither as god nor as demon, but as a connecting infrastructure supporting and galvanizing many local movements. One example of their production is this, the soil map of the world. Originally proposed in the 1940s and 50s by administrators at the FAO, it was a solution to the problem of land use in former European colonies. Had the project been completed in timely fashion, this map would have supported nations in Asia, Africa, and Latin America as they oversaw an effort to wind back the damage done by European col colonization through redistributing the land monopolized by European elites. The transfer of land from vast colonial plantations for export agriculture to sustainable small farmer polyculture was the agenda, part of the political agenda of most po post-colonial nations after the Second World War. 
At the time, this map represented the best technical solution possible at securing a sustainable, peaceful future marked by opportunity for all. An effective nationwide land reform requires a map that helps nations to determine which plots of la land are lush and which are entirely desertified. Otherwise, defining plots of land by a grid will result in some farmers with lush land and some farmers with untillable plots of rock. Today, science tells us that these small farms would have been better at keeping carbon in the ground and ultimately better at supplying communities with food security in the face of a changing planet. And in retrospect, that project would have also represented one of humanity's best chances for securing a low carbon path to development. The global map of soils was a technological feat requiring the coordination of geologists and mapping standards across the world. Unfortunately, coordination was slow. Ultimately, it took 30 years to complete. And there was a tragedy. Once this map was complete, the political will to use the map to support land redistribution had dried up almost everywhere. The map wasn't made in time. So this story emphasizes one dimension of the vulnerability of information infrastructures. If half supported, they can founder or simply fail to meet the political purposes for which they were intended. Ultimately, the soil map represented a waste, a waste of expertise, a waste of geography, a waste of effort. The world map of soils failed not because of some problem in design, but because of the long-term horizon it took to compile the map. Those who talk about technology today sometimes identify maps in general with colonial power and the top-down control of the many by the few. But the 20th century was also an era of experimentation with the politics of technology. For instance, in the distribution of tiny, tiny forms of appropriate technology intended to radically empower peasants to make their own choices. For example, this handheld calculator, the Curta, which was designed by a Holocaust survivor and distributed to Indian peasants by an American nonprofit. Or this participatory meeting where the women of the village are being organized to map the village resources and make their own plan for the village's future needs. The power dynamics of the Kurta and the participatory women's meeting are not without opportunities for co-optation. They aren't entirely positive They're slight, uh, or entirely neutral techniques or technologies. But the point is that the designers of these objects, meetings, and larger information in infrastructures were self-consciously attempting to reverse colonial power. In many times and places, they succeeded. And the warning conveyed by anecdotes about the history of appropriate technology is not that the technology is a demon or that infrastructure is a panopticon. Tech and data can help, but they can only help within the boundaries of the governance structures around them. The failure to defend the FAO against the World Bank meant that farmers in the developing world would lose an opportunity for important reforms that might have protected them. Today, the heirs of those same farmers and in indigenous communities are being evicted by international corporations and national interests to the cost of our collective atmosphere and even the risk of overriding the ecological limits of survival. One of the reasons we fail to design collective solutions is that we mistake the widget for infrastructure, and we assume that the angelic power of technology to liberate man comes from the next new engine, the next new algorithm, or the next new machine, whereas liberation often comes from systems of information protected by democratic, just, and robust systems of governance in which we all participate. We also assume that technology is distinct from other systems of governance, where humans responsible for the collective good make choices about flows of information and objects. Effective infrastructures have to be designed to support human values. Even when they work, they are vulnerable to corruption, co-option, and delay. So the redesign process needs to be constant and vigilant. The human study of the past helps us to make sense of where we have been. Our state of stalemate with respect to climate policy reflects the traps of Cold War thinking, where markets dominate, corporations get rich, international agreements never stick, and democracy is limited. Understanding that other world systems have existed are in, and in, are indeed powerful can help us to design responsible structures for governing the environment. 
Anything we want to protect, earth, water, occupancy, or atmosphere, needs a system of governance backed by data and democratically adjudicated to support the interests of the many. We need information infrastructures designed to support an international principle of occupancy, a world where we can govern our, govern our own atmosphere, land, and water without rendering the earth uninhabitable. If governance is failing, it needs to be redesigned. I ended my last talk with a minor data challenge, and I will follow up here with a short list of things a person can do. Uh, this is not a complete list. What you, what, what, where you, you might fit if you fit with this call to action. And what you do depends on individual talent, skills, backgrounds, and networks. But here is a, here is a starter list. You can tell stories. Historians, social scientists, journalists are telling important stories about how communities' fates around climate are intertwined. You know, organizations to look to include Global Witness. Great reading on the subject is my friend John Clark's book, Between Earth and Empire. You can organize building solidarity movements between the developed world and the developed, uh, developing world, between urban renters in London, wealthy nation environmentalists, and the indigenous and peasant communities of the developing world. I, the International Land Coalition is one of the most important organizations working globally in this space, and I recommend supporting their work and the work of their partners. You can work for government reform, which may mean working to preserve democracy and preserve the right to vote in developed nations like my own. We're working to fight for the rights of poor people where incarcerated people is important here and overseas. Working to redesign international governance if you were in government or the law makes sense if you hear this message about the importance of international institutions and their pow powers. The role of international courts is a question. Britain today, having left the EU, is in a, has a possible leading role to play in these conversations. Some of these issues are also about the flow of financial information and decision making. It may make sense to ask the World Bank to increase the 1% of its funds that it currently allocates to land issues, or ask the World Bank to work directly with the International Land Coalition that is directly making grants to the indigenous people, peasants, and migrants who have traditionally been most vulnerable in terms of land use. And finally, design. I know that there are some uh, this is a Turing Institute talk, and this talk is partially for data scientists. Design of information flows is incredibly important in thinking about a robust information infrastructure for climate governance. Uh, design, desi design action for disrupting ownership and structures implicated in the international systems of exploitation of the earth and eviction of people means looking to rent strikes rather than school strikes, looking to extinction rebellion, science rebellion, and the writings of Andreas Mom. Working with others to design a robust program of data-driven environmental governance where data is collected by frontline communities in the developing world and then backed by appropriate action, that is an even more robust vision. We could build an information infrastructure, an international information infra infrastructure capable of supplying lawsuits against individuals and corporations that are implicated in pollution and eviction. But it would need to be built and designed in such a way that it is, is sustainable and that it validates local democracy local powers of collecting information to, to gird vulnerable communities against eviction. Organizations to look to include Cadasta and Land Matrix, which have a long history of mapping the rights of vulnerable and indigenous people, the World Resource Institute, and those articles in the Climactic Change special issue on actionable climate data, where I have an article entitled, What Kind of Information Does the Era of Climate Change Need? which spells out these arguments in greater detail. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much to Joe for speaking on such a pressing issue and giving us such a bold vision um, in this moment. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Please keep adding your questions and Joe and I are gonna go to our fireside chat now where I'm gonna um, start asking her some of those questions. So keep adding them, keep upvoting them and I'll speak to you in a moment.
Thanks again, Joe, for that talk. Um, and for those of you who are interested um, in buying a copy, this is the hard copy of that book that is out now. Um, you'll be getting a code in your inboxes for 30% off and there's a chance to win a real copy of this. <laughs> um, so I've been looking through these questions that have been popping up on the board and there's some really um, great questions that I'd like to put to you, Joe. Um, the top one at the moment is from Maya again. Um, Maya, you ask great questions. Um, Pressures on land resources often lead to violence rather than rational change. Can data tell compelling stories to stop that cycle? So that's a, it's a great question, Maya. Uh, so, so certainly we hear less than we should in modern journalism about these fights over land. Um, and Global Witness is a London nonprofit that has been documenting um, the assassinations of local organizers of indigenous communities and small farmers who have tried to resist uh, efforts by more mining corporations and other uh, uh, other corporations to take land and to control the will of these communities. The assassinations, um, the numbers of associations are really appalling and there is a data driven story about the escalation of those assassinations over time the defenders of land, the people who are working the hardest to protect their communities and to keep carbon in the ground, they're dying in large numbers. And it's a really tragic story. So yes, please follow up on that. And, um, and I'm sure if you are a storyteller or a data-driven analyst, it is a relatively small community of, of people who, who work on these issues. They need more storytellers. They also need people to just amplify the stories that have been told already. Thank you, that's really good. Um, I there's another really great question here. How do you suggest to emancipate the global south affected on a visible scale by climate crisis from the technological hegemonies in the digital divide? Uh, so that's, it's a terrific question. Yeah. Infrastructure is absolutely implicated in the global digital divide. My first book, Roads to Power, was, uh, as Ruth has already mentioned, it was a, it, it's a book about 18th century Britain, but it was really an allegory for digital divides today. And I talk about digital divides, rural and urban, in developed nations, but also between the global north and the global south. Participating in infrastructure is the only part of the, it is the, it is the sine qua non which is supposed to make the wealth of nations work in Adam Smith's formulation. It is the foundation that creates a, an arena where a rising tide floats all boats. If you don't have connected infrastructure and you can't get your donkey to the market, then capitalism isn't supposed to work for you. And Adam Smith was very clear on this point. That's why he thinks that toll roads should be abolished and tolls on entering the market should be abolished. A rising tide only floats all boats when everyone is connected by infrastructure. So one of the conversations we could have in a world in which international organizations and international governance was taken seriously is how it is that the world has a plan to get people in the global south on board to infrastructure and well connected in the near future in time for capitalism to work to some degree to elevate the economies of the developing world. There is no hope for doing that without the pipes being in place. So I think that's a very important question. Thank you for asking it. Mm. So I think there's a question here about, um, there's a couple of questions here about evidence and persuasiveness um, in light of the observation you made about despite the protest in not affecting change at a policy level. Yeah. So there's a, the question here is, what do you think is the evidence that can change the minds of people to support these land and occupation rights movements? And I, I guess there's people there as twofold, right? Governments as one <laughs> audience, yeah. Yeah. the people writ large is another. Yeah, yeah. So, it, you know, I, ev we've, we've, we've had a collective sort of trauma around climate change evidence in which it, it seems like you amass you amass a body of scientific knowledge and you present it and then it takes 40 years to fight the misinformation and can anything be done? Surely we cannot change our trajectory as a society. Um, if, if pure science and 99% consensus among scientists cannot persuade Congress, then what, what, on, what hope have we? So that's one version of, you know, you know I think something that all people who love science have <laughs> struggled with for the last decade, that question. But I'll, I'll tell you my firm opinion as a historian, which is that we, we have evolved as a people, 
not as a science-loving people. Some of us have become science-loving people. We were educated, we were formed by our instructors into becoming science-loving people. But as a species, we are a story-loving people. Mm. We, we are persuaded by stories. Our ancestors went to churches and heard sermons, and they heard people proclaiming at Hyde Park. And that's how political movements in the past were made. And they could be made very quickly. We know this from history. You know, a great speaker had that power to convert the masses for good or for evil. But stories influence us. They get into us. They arouse our emotions. They arouse our hearts. So we, you know, we have a scary story. We have a legitimately scary story about the power of s the, f the failure of science to win, the failure of the good to win, the demonic and angelic powers of technology, to, which might kill us or might save us, but who knows? Those are terrible, terrifying stories that we've been telling each other. The story of the land movements is a factual story, but it is not a story that was known. It hasn't been floating around there. Little pieces of it were known. If you were an Irish historian, you knew about the Irish land war. If you were a Kenyan historian, you knew about the Mau Mau. If you were an Indian historian, then you knew about uh, Gandhi and Vinoba. But nobody had ever told these as one arc before. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I wanted to go after these stories in this book and knit them together into one long arc of a hundred years, which is not something that historians do that frequently. A hundred years is a little long for most historians. But I, I understood that it would be very important and very powerful to tell a new story about the events of the Cold War, where the drama was not the con unending conflict between capitalism and communism, but a story, of, a story that has some hope and some concrete warnings about the governance of land. I'm fundamentally interested in public space, in the governance of land, of what, it ho what we hold as a commons. That's why I've written in the past about roads and infrastructure and public spaces in the city. But I made a transition about 10 years ago to thinking about these rural themes and about the legality of, of legislating the countryside so that small farmers had a chance to survive, so that there's le and legislating the city so that everyone can afford to live there. So rent control and land reform, they come into being at the same time. The first land reform in 1881 is the first rent control. And that, that hundred year trajectory where these ideas spread and percolate and take new forms and then an international movement is founded and international organizations are made and they are supplying each other with tactics. This is a powerful story about a lot of legislation that had real consequences for people living in the developing world, opportunities for families across Mexico, opportuni uh, opportunities for families across Ireland, and for many people in many states in India. They had a chance to crawl out of abject poverty because of this legislation. The, co the story in Ireland is absolutely stunning. It was a, uh, it was a total, out total absentee owned colony with a starving working class, one third of whom died in the famine of the 1840s. One third, one third immigrates, one third survives on gruel and poverty. And it was a miserable place. 40 years later, they pass legislation. Parliament, English, England's parliament passes legislation to turn over all of the land of Ireland to the peasant proprietors, fixing rents so that rents will no longer impoverish them. So what happens in Ireland thereafter is complex and it can't be entirely explained by property holding. But I think when we put the succession of events around land redistribution together in a global forum, we see this arc and it is an arc of hope. It's, it is an arc about how stories change people's minds, how one utopian vision begets another utopian vision, how international movements reinforce each other and how how that did change land holding on the face of the earth and it could change how we govern land, water and atmosphere again. I think it's really compelling this argument to look, look both long durée and cross kind of trans um, national. Are, th are there particular insights that you have gleaned by thinking in that sort of trans historical way that you couldn't have have derived from just thinking on a national context in a national context. Yes, that's absolutely right. So these stories were known, as I said, within the national traditions, and and you know, had I had I just examined the the case of Ireland, then it would have been a very different story. So it's seeing the connections between people. I mean, literally, the organizers in Ireland and the organizers in India are meeting in London and sharing tactics. And that's one of the ways that the rent strike goes from Ireland to India. And then the Indians, the Indian, 
and they're calling the stories by the same words. They're chanting the same words, land to the tiller, the rent strike. And these ideas percolate and advance, and d people in the developing region are not just organizers and the receivers of the idea. They're also inventors of new models, and I talk about this, how appropriate technology is itself a Gandhian concept mm. that is then received by people in from Britain and the United States and planted at the United Nations, and they understand that this is a valuable concept for enriching people in the developing world and helping farmers to uh, hold on to their land. And it's distorted. There are distortions. There are co-optations. So you can tell a complex story about communities, communities supporting each other across international boundaries and international reforms. And you can see those those vulnerabilities in a new light that I find very surprising coming from traditions of national history, where it's, you know, it's it race and class are certain things. It's much more complicated once you go across national boundaries. You find surprising uh, continuities and connections. For example, the slogan of the Peruvian organizer Hugo Blanco, Tierra um, o Muerte, he's fighting for indigenous property rights in Peru. That slogan appears in Tierra Amarillo, no, New Mexico, across the border from where I live in Texas, mm -hmm. by the 1960s, where there's a Latino group who's fighting for their land rights. So what is that? It's not just Latino identity in the United States. They do have a Latino identity, but they also have this international solidarity. And they've been emboldened, if you will, emboldened by the United Nations and these international reforms and movements to stand up against the corrupt gringo sheriff in New Mexico who's just stealing Latino land mm -hmm. and the judges are white and so the Latinos can't do anything. They're emboldened by Hugo Blanco, Tierra o Muerte. They paint his vision on the side of, the, his visage on the side of bu buildings. So, you know, I think we see in these stories of international connections some hope for how people embolden each other and how new strategies percolate, new techniques. I refer to these, and not just technologies, but also the techniques, the techniques of marching in the streets or the slogans or participatory mapping itself. Mm. And there are some warnings as well. There are some, st some warnings, but they're more complex than they would be in the national tradition. Mm. Thanks, Joe. Um, great question here. What role does global debt play in current movements for land reform? Uh, so great question. Um, uh, so global debt is is the classical issue that we've been fighting against for decades, uh, where the World Bank is responsible. Um, and uh, global debt came into being at the same time as the World Bank took this assertive role in the privatization of land policy. Now my my book effectively ends in 1974, so I've got you know a handful of pages about the World Bank turn towards. Um, a free market in land in the 1980s and 1990s. I've got the names of the first two places where that appears, but I think it's going to be, it's going to remain for other scholars to map um, the role of debt in those land, uh, in financializing the surveying of the land and, and the financialization of land as property. It's a very important theme. It's, uh, and it's politically very hot right now. Yes as I'm sure you're aware in many, <laughs> in many places. Thanks, Joe. There's yeah. a great question here from Emma. I'd love to hear you connect your earlier work on transport infrastructure with this new work on land for agriculture. What's familiar and what's new? Uh, thanks for asking that, Emma. Yeah, so both, both my early work on, on uh, road systems and this work on the United Nations, they're effectively about information infrastructures. And I make those connections in a very robust way in the book's conclusion. So in, in my first book, I was interested in the formation of the Society of Civil Engineers. And the first time that there is a board of roads that's designing road connections across Britain. It's the world's first inter-kingdom highway system, if you will. Uh, in this book, I'm also interested in the formation of a bu bureaucracy, a bureaucracy that comes into being uh, to create a, uh, for, for a perceived common problem. But it's an international bureaucracy, it's not a national bureaucracy. We know relatively little about rank and file international bureaucracies because most of the work that's been done on the history of international organizations has been done at the Paul Kennedy level, which is to save diplomatic theory, which is nothing against Paul Kennedy. It's very, very valu valuable. That work is very valuable and I learned a lot from it. But there's much less about the rank and file of the people working within UNESCO. There's more about Aldous Huxley's vision for UNESCO 
there's le- more about the founders of the FAO than the people, rank and file people working within the FAO. So I wanted to go over, uh, over those, I wanted to go after those civil servants and what they did. And so I spent a lot of time with the papers of the Land and Water Office trying to figure out who they were talking to. And they're talking to amazing people. They're reading a long, young Amartya Sen. They're interacting with the young James C. Scott. There's a you know, huge intellectual world at the rank of this level of this bureaucracy. Um, and uh, in both books, I'm, I'm interested in the governance of land and changing ideas of what property is and what the public good mm. is, both in the era of Adam Smith and in the era of the un- early United Nations. We were working with robust ideas about capitalism and wealth and ownership, which make room for private ownership, Lockean style, but also public and collective ownership. The road is essentially a forum of public ownership. Once you've removed the toll gates, if you have a bridge across the Thames, that's an in- you can fa- thank David Ricardo in 1815 <laughs> and the Anti-Turnpike Association for the fact that you don't have to pay a toll every time you cross the Thames River in a footbridge. Um, so in the same way, after the Second World War, there is essentially an intellectual discovery in economic history that there could be something called common land or right to housing or occupancy rights and that's you know there's an there's an evolution of those idea occupancy rights i would date to 1881 the idea of common land or indigenous land i would date to after the work of eleanor ostrom who really formalizes it for the first time so i'm interested in economic concepts that come into being because of social movements uh, and the interface between bureaucracies social movements and ideas Mm. thank you Um, I think I've asked that question at the top. Um, Ah, this is a good one. How how does bias in the data that's available about land use and change impact the politics of land right? So again, this this is the question connecting your your talks today nicely. Yes, yes, thank you for that connective question. Uh, So yes, um, so in general, the the data, when we talk about the data of land use, what sorts of data of land use the state has access to or we all have access to, We're talking about systems for describing land that were developed at the beginning of the 19th century. We're talking about the ordinance survey. We're talking about titling and cadastres. And these are, by and large, systems of government, systems of documents, which were designed from the 17th century, from the 18th century forward to protect the rights of a tiny minority of aristocratic landholders. I'm rich. I can hire someone to design a map. Here is a map of my estate and how I'm going to improve it. And I have the resources to employ lawyers to defend my right and, uh, mm-hmm. and make sure that nobody takes this land away from me and I get the maximum revenue from my tenants. Um, in the period of time that I cover in the Long Land War, there are efforts to rethink the system of mapping and the data we have about land. And the foremost, the foremost invention of this period, I would argue, is the invention of participatory mapping where you know, I showed you that m- community meeting of women, but what they were doing before they sat down is they were literally walking up the hill and down the hill and to the well and to the ponds and through the houses and talking about the community's resources and how, who is administrating them. Does the well need to get mucked out? Who does that? How does that labor work? How does the ownership work? And then they're talking about how it should work. So they're forming their own self-governing bureaucracy, if you will, their so own information infrastructure. and. In many parts of the developing world today, those activities go on. They're legislated by the government of India, along with certain kinds of environmental grants today that you have to have a participatory map. You have to go through this participatory process. So it's part of how the developing world is governed. And it's how much of the developing world, de- developed world aspires to be governed. You know, We are also doing community science, citizen science, collecting information about who's getting sick. Um, it's not part of how the UK national government or the US national government collect data. But I think this is a democratic aspiration for how the data of our environment should be collected. And I think the question is, are we willing to put to to trust that data collectively to establish mechanisms for trust where though we are aware participatory data can be co-opted, it can be corrupted, can we collectively establish mechanisms to guard that data 
People of color say they're getting sick from cancer from the chemical plant next door. People, poor people in India say they're getting sick from the tannery that's polluting their water and they have a map. Both of them have maps. Can we protect that data? Mm. Can we pay them to collect their data? Can we protect that process and make it global and binding so that it's something courts can work on. It's something that our bureaucracy works on. I see this as a natural step in, if you will, the evolution of the bureaucracy. That is a very old fashioned way of conceptualizing large scale historical change. I lack a more nuanced way to talk about evolution because it's not, but it is evolutionary in the sense that uh, it, there may not be laws, but there are interactive processes over the long term that produce certain structures. Our bureaucracies have been evolving. Once upon a time, there wasn't a society of civil engineers. Now, there, now every developed nation has engineers who make sure that you have a sidewalk mm -hmm. and you don't pay for it. So what would it mean if we all had data about who's getting sick from the chemicals, who's polluting the atmosphere? If we didn't, we paid for it collectively through our taxes and it rationalized all of these, you know, essentially free riding by the rich on our collective atmosphere, free riding by the rich on the back of evicted poor people. Mm -hmm. it's, it, this, is, this is a rational problem that where data has a role to play. Society, community values also have a role to play, but it's, it, the both data and society are needed to deal with these econo mm. essentially economic problems. Mm. I think it's interesting. You've actually kind of um, unwittingly answered a question here that's put in a different way. What, mm. uh, what are the quantitative arguments for weighing the net benefits of infrastructure and those who are the casualties of rolling them out? Mm. Um, but uh, by thinking about that kind of participatory data, it allows us to kind of have data on those kind of net casualties. Mm. Um, but I think it's also taking us towards the the statement slash question of um, a, another um, anonymous poster here who writes the argument that avoiding climate change is good for business is seen as one of the only ways to achieve it essentially kind of like a <laughs> the argument for capitalism um, mm -hmm. uh, do you believe that it needs to be about equality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm I well I wouldn't be the only person to make that argument right you know we're hearing a number of important critical voices saying that uh, we, when we talk about climate change, we have to talk about race. You know, the, the venerable institution of environmental uh, history has you know, long understood that environmental racism is a real thing. The, pla the place where the chemicals are spit out in America often happens to be where the folk of color live. And they, they do get sick. Uh, and right now, you know, participatory mapping, if you have a really good organizer and you have some really good pro bono lawyers, that's your best route to getting justice, but it takes years. And the, in the infrastructure has to be invented from scratch every time. Well, this is something we talk about in data science, like inventing the infrastructure and the machine learning process from scratch every time is madness. That's super expensive. That's super expensive socially. It's much better to turn it in, recognize that it's an externality and collectivize that. That's why we have CRAN for R, you know, share your programs and people build upon them. That's how you get a social good. And then, you know, that's, that's not anti-capitalism. Like Graeber would say, you know, the, you can share the, you can share the stapler in the office building. The CEO doesn't pay a fine to the secretary when he borrows the stapler. That's not how it works. So you collectivize certain aspects you share certain aspects of the infrastructure and it makes systems of exchange more robust and more efficient. Thank you. Um, this question is, connecting large scale data to the local experience is really hard. Have you seen good experiences of translating this type of data into experience that people can understand? Um, Oh, so uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll quote, shout out to the work of uh, Public Lab and my good friend, the organizer Liz Berry, who's taught me more than anyone else about community science and citizen science. Please look up their work. So, Community Public Lab is a nonprofit that's uh, I think ten years old now in the United States. Uh, they're composed of activists, um, data people, s actual scientists, uh, and and artists. Uh, and the, the work of artists has been really important in their campaigns because they've done things like 
uh, work with the Friends of the Gowanus Canal to map every place in the Gowanus Canal where there's a little bit of oil leached into the canal every second Tuesday at 2 p.m., which suggests that those people know very well that they're polluting. And if you map it, then you see all of these patterns. So they map it with lots of people going around with handheld devices, taking pictures, and then assembling them into a map. And when you assemble them into a map and you've got the data about the time, the times of the pollution and the pictures, you've got a lot of data and it's very persuasive. So one of the things that I found as I was looking at the archive of the, of the participatory mapping movements, I visited two archives for the participatory mapping movements, is that this kind of work has been going on in the developing world and in indigenous communities for it, since at least the 1970s when the Beaver and Cree people in Canada are mapping indigenous land rights and they, their communities eventually start documenting uh, in instances of intrusion by the mineral rights and logging companies. Uh, those form rich documents which have been offered, authored by 200 individuals and judges can understand that information. So I it's not simply that you know if you make an app it will come and then you can change the world. The infrastructure needs to include really good thoughtful design it needs, to un it needs to be transparent to the issues uh, recognized by the community, the will of the community, and protect their rights and the purposes that they need. And in many cases, uh, you know, the information is sensitive because people you know, don't want to be charged by their health insurance company or if they're writing down sacred Indian place names to claim, I to make the case of Indian occupancy, they don't want that data to leave their database. So uh, the database design issues are non-trivial. They're non-trivial, but that's not a reason why it shouldn't be done. We've got really creative desi um, designers of databases, and we've got really articulate, careful representatives from those communities who have been designing their own databases in this more com computationally driven age. So it's, you know, it's a matter of putting, I think, a larger scale of services and regularization of justice at the feet of the indigenous and local communities that have been at the forefront of this research, of saying how can we help you and how can we amplify you, and valuing this as a community, as something that needs to be looked at. It will tend to grow in sophistication and power the more data scientists, data scientists look at it and help. But please, you know, ask them what to do. Don't design it for them and tell them afterwards. That's the trick. That's really important. I think that's one of the <laughs> one of the really nice values that came out of the data feminism book, um, and with a kind of really great yeah. guidelines for how uh, data scientists should interact with communities. Um, yeah, we should yeah. just mention that the the our our friends, the authors, yeah. Lauren Klein and, and Catherine Dignacio did a fantastic job with that that book. And is it one of the chapters the the guidelines for interacting with? with yeah. communities. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, there was a chewing talk on that if you want to look it up. Um, so um, a couple of last questions before we wrap up. Um, have you actually used data-driven methods in topics relating to this book? I know this book is a kind of analog history book, yes. but are there? Um, have you explored these topics um, through your digital work? And if so, could you say a little bit more about that? Yes, so uh, when I originally started writing about the Long Land War, I, I thought that I, I would be writing a 200-year book. I conceived of a very different book, a 200-year book about British Empire in the modern world, the land rights around British Empire. And I thought that that would be possible because of these new digital methods. So that was I was, I was scheming that book when we wrote the History Manifesto and we were arguing for the long durée and the power of data-driven history. And of course, when you get your, your hands dirty with a new method, you start to understand what, how it works and what its limits were. And one of the hard limits you run up against in digital history is the availability of clean data, clean textual data and archives. Not all of the data is immediately useful or clean or accessible. A lot of the newspaper data, for example, is behind paywalls, at least in Britain. Um, so that's a, that, you know, that's a problem for a different kind of commons and a different kind of conversation. Um, so, in fact, I, I wound up working with data-driven methods on problems of property ownership in 19th century parliamentary speech. We had good data on parliamentary speech. People in parliament then, as now, talk a lot about ownership and property and how to regulate it. And uh, using data-driven methods, I was able to 
um, compose a lot of research about uh, property ownership mm -hmm. and ideas about property ownership. So that's uh, material for a forthcoming book that's currently in manuscript. Um, uh, but meanwhile, I was working on the 20th century, and if, you know, there are tons of electronic documents from 20th century bureaucracies like the United Nations. Some of them have been digitalized, but unevenly. Um, I tried taking photographs, making PDFs while I was in the archive. The OCR was not so good at that point, uh, so I wasn't uh, ultimately able to do uh, data-driven analysis. But this is, you know, we also know as historians that there are subjects of interest that command your, they command your interest because the problem is so important to society, right? Understanding the genesis of property, understanding uh, the fact that there was a global smallholders movement, understanding why international government failed to achieve its best goals in the 20th century. Those, those are so important to understand whether or not you've got the digital methods to do so. So mm. the appropriate tool was through traditional archives. So I used traditional archives, traditional archives and dialogue with the secondary sources. And many thanks to everyone I cited uh, you know, who had written similarly archivally driven books. It's, uh, you know, those tools of the humanities and of history for understanding where we are in terms of time and why it has been so hard to fight climate change, they are invaluable. And we still need departments of history to do this kind of work, even in a data-driven age. Even if we use the history of technology in order to comment on data infrastructures, this is an uh, history is an unrivaled tool for self-understanding. Thank you, that's really great. Um, uh, I'm just going to ask th the la these last two questions um, in a kind of a related way. Um, I, I think one of the things that was really interesting was how you talked about this movement of strategies and phrases and um, that those kind of networks that people brought people together. That's actually much more possible now mm. but at the same time we have a situation um, in which we have a very um, fragmented distrib digital distribution as per mm. this question that I like that phrasing this fragmented digital distribution um, we have the kind of polarization of communities uh, we have echo chambers um, which has made storytelling more difficult in some ways so could you speak to that the kind of Mm. the uh, the pros and cons of the digital age in kind of uniting those strategies. Yeah, so we talked a little in the last Q&A about um, the transnational and the text searchable mm. and the way that digital his databases of, of uh, texts have made, made it possible, made it easier for many historians to do uh, transnational histories where they're tracing Irish immigrants across the Atlantic, for example, or tracing Caribbean theater shows as they travel across the American South, as Larry Putnam does. Um, uh, so, so that's really interesting. But uh, you know, the, the the long hand of nationalism continues to structure a lot of data. So we see this as historians, um, maybe more than other people, because we're always paying attention to boundaries international boundaries and boundaries of information. If you go looking for history at the British Library, British Library has done wonderful things to digitalize text. National Archives have done wonderful things to digitalize text, but they mainly concentrate on the archives of Britain. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the same thing in the United States. The Library of Congress has done wonderful things to digitalize text and newspapers and the annals of con Congress, and we have such rich repositories um, there's much less money available for digitalizing resources from the developing world. And when it comes to grants, you know, the grants are there for digitalizing the resources of the nation. They have been in many cases in the United States and Europe and sometimes in Britain. Um, but, uh, but then you get national grants. So there are EU grants for researching history. And, uh, and so you write the grant to research European history, which means not Britain and not the United States. And that's very strange, right? That's very strange to historians uh, because we, we understand that the United States and Europe evolved together. Mm -hmm. So think of it again. We've got lots of data about British experience, but much less about Jamaican experience, Brazilian experience, Indian experience, who is, who is paying to digitalize the archives of India? 
And th that, you know, those archives may be crucial if you want to understand something about Adivasi land rights in a robust way. So this is connected in order to have the data about land ownership and occupancy, about eviction in the past, about reparations, you would want to have robust international archives. Mm -hmm. But that's not something that's being funded right now. And so from the, the point of view of a, you know, an unbiased historian who just wants to know the truth, just wants to know the truth of who owned the land and when it was stolen and was it paid for and what happened to those people, uh, we haven't built the infrastructure to actually get at the truth of international experience, which we know is out there. It's out there in paper form. It's, it's expensive to digitalize, but it's not, you know, it's not expensive like founding a university expensive. So those are, those are you know, issues lar not the same as the mighty issues of climate change, but they are issues that structure the world's knowledge. And another illustration of how, how important internationalism in terms of infrastructure building is mm -hmm. today. It's not, it's not merely about uh, access to archives, it's also about international connections, and participation in the market, and all of these other issues we've been talking about. But I think these, all of those themes are united, uh, they're united and connected by this common thread of the value of internationalism, the value of infrastructure to connect, and the fact that we have been living in a Cold War world in which we only build one nation at a time. I think that's a great note on which to finish. Thank you so much to Joe today for provoking us in multiple ways. It's been, she's run two marathons, giving us two talks, two <laughs> fireside chats. So hugely thank thankful to you, hugely thankful to our audience and the questions that have been coming in. Um, and please join me in giving Joe a virtual round of applause. Thank you and good night, everyone.